Christmas morning in the Ramsey household always starts with a late breakfast of deliciously creamy scrambled eggs and smoked salmon. This recipe is a Ramsey family tradition on Christmas Day. Smoked salmon, scrambled egg and croissant. It's rich, sumptuous and incredibly easy to do. First the croissants. Slice them into rounds and season them lightly with salt and pepper. The secret behind a really good breakfast is in the timing. I want the croissants on first, smoked salmon on top and then the scrambled egg. Put the croissants in a dry pan and toast. You don't need oil because the croissants have a lot of butter in them. This is a great way to transform day-old croissants, giving them a delicious new life. You can just start to see them toasting, almost glistening in the pan. And that's the butter inside. That smell is amazing. It almost smells like a sort of caramelized waffle. Absolutely delicious. Toast them all around, both sides, and then out. Next, just get the smoked salmon and sort of twist it and let it fall over the croissant. Let it sit naturally on top of the toasted croissant. Little twist and over. Right, scrambled eggs. Eggs into the pan. Never whip up the eggs beforehand. You break down the egg too much. What I want is a really nice, rich, creamy scrambled egg. Eggs in. No seasoning at this stage. A nice, generous knob of butter. Now, from there, onto the heat. And all we're gonna do now is stir. Stir and stir and stir. Now the butter's melting and it's giving a really nice creamy texture to the eggs. It looks rich, delicious, sumptuous, luxurious. If you're very careful making scrambled egg, all of a sudden it looks runny, and within 30 seconds it's cooked, working it all the time. Right, after stirring, a plastic scraper in there. Take the pan off the heat and just work round the pan, cleaning up all that scrambled egg that's sticking to the bottom. And now look, we're getting that really nice sort of creamy, beautiful texture. A little touch of butter in there. Now, I'm gonna start with the seasoning. 30 seconds from the end, salt, pepper. Back on to the stove and a tablespoon of cream. The cream actually stops the scrambled egg from overcooking. Cream in and then fold that in there. Now, keep that off the heat. But look at it, look at that color. Beautiful. And then finally, some fresh chives. is a Ramsey classic. Smoked salmon, toasted croissant, and a delicious scrambled egg. The best start to Christmas Day anyone could wish for. Let's go. Making a stunning pork, apricot, and pistachio stuffing the day before is a great way to get ahead. It's easy to do, looks a million dollars, and tastes absolutely delicious. Christmas dinner for me is not about food piled high on a plate. Less is more. I'd rather have five or six things on a plate that taste absolutely delicious than 10 items tasting average. Stuffing, for instance. I'd much rather put a lot more effort into the stuffing and enjoy it, but eat a lot less of it. First, add pork mince to the bowl, season with salt and pepper, and mix. Take your grater and a braver apple. Just get the grater and grate the apple in there. Usually stuffing is cooked in the turkey, but I'm doing mine separately so I can make it in advance and get the flavor and presentation spot on. Now the nice thing about the apple, it goes brilliantly well with the pork, it makes it a little bit sweeter. It also makes it a lot lighter as well, which is really important. Next, add a handful of chopped apricots, which gives the stuffing another fruity note and a lovely texture. The apple disintegrates, but the apricots stay really nice and intact. Nice little bite. Then chop a handful of pistachio nuts. Again, I'm thinking of the buildup of textures, flavor, and also color. Pistachio is in. Now, give that a really good mix. Grating some lemon zest, 
the zest is packed full of intensely flavoured essential oils, which gives the stuffing a vibrant citrus zing. And for freshness, add a handful of coarsely chopped parsley. The balance of flavours is nice and delicate, and it sits beautifully with the turkey. Now, sage and pork and apple, that's the perfect marriage. Now I'm going to think about the presentation skills. Tim Fall. A little drizzle of olive oil. And then we got a really nice fragrant sage leaves. The sage leaves are used to wrap the stuffing. Start by overlapping them. It's almost like rolling a cigar, but we're going to roll it in sage leaves. Taste is paramount, but presentation is really important too. So it's worth spending a few extra minutes to get this right, because it will make the final dish look amazing. Now, a little season across the top. And then take your sausage meat. And what we want to do now is put half of it onto the plate. Run your finger along the stuffing. This is where it takes on a completely different flavour again. I need some spice in there. I want a little bit of heat in the stuffing so it's exciting to eat. Mergays. Mergays are traditional North African sausages made from beef or lamb. And all we're going to do now is take the sausage and lay that in the middle. They're flavoured with harissa, a fiery chilli paste which gives them their heat and distinctive colour. It really does give that nice sort of wake-up core inside the stuffing. If you can't get hold of mergays, other spicy sausages like shrizo would work well too. Take the rest of the stuffing and we'll sit that on top so it encases that mergays. Once you've got it like that, lift up the tinfoil very carefully, and roll that over. Let the temple do the work, roll it nice and tight. There. Fingers underneath. Just pull that back and double check. Lovely. Look at it, it's not even cooked yet and it looks delicious. The ultimate Christmas cracker, fantastic. That sage will cook and really perfume the sausage meat and you cut through to the centre, you've got that nice spicy sausage. Lovely. In. Now, roll it across, twist at the ends, and then from there, up into the hands, and you push it in, and twist and turn. And all that's doing is just making the perfect cylinder. Beautiful. The stuffing can be made, wrapped and stored in the fridge a day or two in advance. That's the first part of my ultimate Christmas dinner ready. On Christmas Day, simply pop it into the oven and cook at 200 degrees for 40 minutes. Sauces are one of the important ways chefs add extra dimension and flavour to dishes. You can use this trick at home. My caramelised cranberry and apple sauce is another recipe I always cook a day in advance. It packs a wonderful punch that really lifts the subtle flavour of the turkey. It's simple to make and with its deep red vibrant colour, looks fantastic on the plate. The secret behind any good Christmas is in the organisation and the preparation. Anything you can get done in advance, do it. Apple and cranberry sauce is a prime example. First things first, we're going to make a really nice caramel. Sugar in. Add 150 grams of caster sugar to a pan, followed by a couple of star anise. That helps to really give a nice sort of aniseed flavour to the cranberries. Next, lightly crush four cardamom pods. This adds a lovely warm, spicy, sweet flavour. Then wait for the sugar to melt and form a caramel. Really important to have the confidence now to colour that caramel so it gets really nice and dark before putting the cranberries in. Wow. The smell of that caramel is amazing. Now, cranberries in. Cranberries are very tart and acidic, but balanced with the sweetness of the caramel and apples, 
they give the sauce a lovely dry, sharp note. To tell if they're fresh, drop them on a hard service. The higher they bounce, the fresher they are. The secret now is for the caramel to blister the cranberries and really start to break that down. It smells fantastic. Next, core, peel, and thinly slice two apples. And once the sauce is finished, it really does help to sort of wake up the flavour of the turkey. Now the cranberries are starting to break down. Apple in. Smells fantastic. A touch of salt and pepper. That's really important. Really helps to balance that tartness against the acidity of the apple. Salt and pepper really brings it back. The smell is fantastic. It's like a sort of sweet, sour, spicy, nice. Now from there, delays the pan with a touch of port. Round the side. Deglazing dissolves all the lovely sticky caramelised bits of food that are stuck to the pan and incorporates them into the sauce. Next, add the zest of an orange. And for another layer of fragrant sweetness, squeeze in the juice. Lovely. Then cook on a low heat for five to 10 minutes to thicken. But remember, the sauce will become even thicker once it's cooled down. Now, that is the right texture. I don't want a runny sauce. I want something really nice and thick, delicious, packed full of flavour. Perfect. If you really want to get ahead, this sauce can be made three or four days in advance and kept in the fridge, which allows the flavours to develop even more. Mm. Then on Christmas Day, simply bring it up to room temperature and serve. Another job done, leaving you more time to enjoy this very special day. This dish is another twist on tradition. It gives the potatoes a lovely colour and their spicy kick helps complement and lift the whole Christmas meal. We're just going to do, again, a little twist to the potatoes. We do need some goose fat, are we? Uh, no, no. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> goose fat. And we're going to do a really nice, um, lightly spiced roast potato, OK? A little chilli flake. Chilli? Yeah, chilli flake. Just to put a little bit of heat in there. For the Christmas lunch? Yep, chilli flake and a little bit of turmeric. I can't believe you're doing roast potatoes with chilli. <laughs> now, would you be so kind just to give them a little cut? Cut the peeled potatoes into quarters and put into salted cold water. In they go. OK. Bring them up to the boil and simmer for around eight minutes. Drain and let them steam. Then season with salt and pepper. On there. And just a little teaspoon of chilli flake. Oh. No? That's the sort of thing I would make for supper on a Saturday night or something like that, you know? Really? Chilli flakes in. Add a teaspoon of turmeric. Turmeric is a member of the ginger family. It stains the potatoes a wonderful golden colour and adds a lovely earthy taste. Next, drizzle in a little olive oil and shake to coat them. Just let them roll round. Yeah. That smells nice. Beautiful. And could you get me the uh, stuffing, please, from the fridge? Put in a preheated baking tray with extra olive oil and cook at 200 degrees Celsius for about 40 minutes. Give them a little shake to make sure they don't stick. And then I'll just stick the stuffing. Thank you, Mum. On top, yeah? Now, that will take roughly about the same time as potatoes. Stuffing in, potatoes done. Nice. Why are you going to play with the kids? I will do, yeah. OK. See you shortly. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Christmas dinner wouldn't be complete without Brussels sprouts. But when I was a child, they were boiled until horribly soft. I want to keep my sprouts crisp, vibrant and fresh. Sautéed with pancetta and chestnuts, these are sprouts like you've never tasted before. And Brussels sprouts are delicious when they're cooked perfectly, packed with texture. And the flavour is extraordinary. Take off the outer leaves, trim the bottom and cut in half. That's a big step up from the crisscross on the bottom that my mother used to do every Christmas. I'm cutting them in half, so when I sauté them, they cook evenly. And look, it's like little baby cabbages. It's so compact. Then blanch them in salted boiling water for two minutes. Now, this is the most amazing pancetta, lightly cured. Pancetta is a type of Italian bacon which is brilliant for adding a lovely, rich, meaty flavour to dishes. I want a really nice, robust flavour to go with that earthy texture of the sprout. 
It's made from pork belly and is dry cured with salt and aromatics like juniper, bay leaves, nutmeg, dry thyme and garlic. As it hits the pan, that fat on top of the pancetta melts and gives the sprouts this amazing flavour. After removing the skin, cut into small chunks. If you can't get hold of pancetta, smoked streaky bacon is a good alternative. Now, hot pan, a teaspoon of olive oil. Give it a light seasoning with salt and pepper. As the larvae start to crisp up, take your sprouts out, drain them, sprouts in. Now give that a really nice little toss. Then chop up a handful of chestnuts. Now the chestnuts sweeten the flavour of the sprout. Really important that you don't put the chestnuts in too early, otherwise they'll go mush. And then just sprinkle the chestnuts over. Lovely. So we've managed to turn a sort of plain Jane sprout into something quite delicious. You've got the texture of the smoked bacon, the sautéed sprout, and that nice crunch and sweetness of the festive chestnut. Ten seconds before they come out, lemon zest. Over. Now that makes the sprouts and the bacon harmonize. And then just a squeeze of fresh lemon juice over the sprouts. Beautiful. This right now is the ultimate. And for me, that's a really nice, modern, 21st century approach to cooking an old-fashioned vegetable. Right, listen, I need some help. Okay, we're gonna make the most amazing pumpkin soup. Feel? That's heavy. It's very heavy. But it is gonna be absolutely delicious, right? Now, you can always tell, okay, if it's ripe, it would bang on there. What does that sound like? Um, drums. Drums, that's right. And if you push your thumb in there, it should be just a little bit soft, right at the bottom of the root. Yeah. Right, first of all, we're going to cut it in half. And very carefully, just cut through. I'm using a French pumpkin. But these versatile vegetables come in all shapes and sizes and colours. At this time of year, their nutty sweetness is ideal for warming soups, curries and roasts. Wait and see what happens when we open this up. Wow. Oh, oh. So right, Holly, that's for you. Now, this is where it's going to get a little bit gory, OK? You get your hands and you scrape the seeds out. <laughs> Put it's them like the getting messy. Rub them together and just give them a little clean. Nice and gently. Good. Yeah? Nice. Look at that. Yuck. What do you mean, yuck? Come on, Holly. That's it. Into the water. Now, once the seeds are out, we're going to toast them in the oven as a little snack. So this is a really nice way of not wasting anything. Get your fingers right in there, Tilly. There you go. Boo. <laughs> Once the pumpkin seeds are out, score the flesh to help it roast and absorb flavour. Season and add a generous amount of rosemary. Take the garlic, rub around the outside so it perfumes the inside. Then add a large glug of olive oil. And as the garlic roasts with the rosemary, its sweet, almost buttery, nutty taste will mellow and flavour the pumpkin. All the seeds done? Yeah, almost. Good. After the pumpkin seeds have been cleaned, dry and season them, ready for the oven. Now they're going to roast in the oven for about 45 to 50 minutes. Well done. Good. And wait and smell the house in about five minutes' time. Tray, please, Holly. So. Beautiful, straight in. Right, well done. Uh, big question, have you wrapped Mummy's present yet? No. Let's go. I'll give you a hand, quickly. God, that garlic smells amazing. Yeah. Holly, Tilly, where's Holly? She's gone to a party. She's gone to a party? Oh, no. Um, <laughs> any boys there? I don't know. Oh, you're so diplomatic. Right, look, they are now toasted. 
Hear that? Right, have a little taste of one of those. Nice? Yeah. But look at this. Wow. wow. That looks amazing. And that is your roasted pumpkin. Now, you put the spoon down the side. Okay? Yeah. Scooping out all that lovely pumpkin. roast pumpkin. We don't waste anything. Hear that skin? All into the centre. Roasting a pumpkin intensifies the rich, sweet flavour of its flesh, which is lovely for soups, but also great as a filling for ravioli or making a delicious mash with butter, nutmeg and salt and pepper. That's the pumpkin done. Now, what I want you to do is get these mushrooms here and just peel them lengthways, OK, onto the plate. OK, and I'll get my onion chopped. Olive oil in. OK? Yeah. Nice and generous with the olive oil, because I want this soup to be really nice and velvety. Onions in. Mmm. And then scoop out that wonderful garlic that's been roasted on the pumpkin. Mmm. Mm. Lovely. A little bit of nutmeg on top of the onions. Onions, garlic, nutmeg, yeah? And now, the pumpkin. Mmm. Wow. See that? Yeah. I knew it would come in handy somewhere. This little baby is for you. There you go. Perfect. Now, I want you just to grate some parmesan like that for me, OK? Just so I can start roasting off the parmesan as well, so we get this really nice, rich, delicious the pumpkin. Parmesan's brilliant for enriching this soup. Its mellow caramel flavour and saltiness provide a lovely balance to the sweet pumpkin. Now what I want you to do is tip all that in there, OK? Yeah? Good. Look at that now. That, huh? Mmm, smell that. Roasted, sort of cheesy, rosemary, garlicky, yeah, olive oily, beautiful. So far, nothing's gone to waste. We've used the whole pumpkin. Now I'm going to add the stock my ham was cooked in. It smells of cinnamon. It does smell of cinnamon, doesn't it? It smells Christmassy. Delicious. Very Christmassy. That's just from cooking our ham. Bring that up to the boil, and we'll let that cook out for 10 minutes. The cream, really important that it's boiling when the cream goes in. OK, you'll see the colour lightening. So that's going to give it a really nice, rich, creamy taste. OK, now we're going to soak the mushrooms. A little bit of olive oil in there, yeah? Get nice and hot. We'll go first with the trompe de la mort. In you go. Good girl. Then the pied de mouton, in. And then finally, chanterelle. Nice, lovely. I want you to put a little bit of butter in there. Off we go. Good girl. A little bit of butter there. Nice. I love the deep, complex flavour of wild mushrooms. But if you can't get them, chestnut or filled mushrooms still deliver great taste. Mushrooms work really well with pumpkin because they have a warm, earthy flavour that complements the pumpkin beautifully. So. Mushrooms into the centre. Yeah? Yeah. From there, we get the parmesan and just peel nice long layers. Watch very carefully. No, just sit that on top. Now the parmesan helps to season the mushroom and really give off an amazing flavour. Okay. We're going to blend the soup, and all we're going to do is half fill the blender so the soup gets really nicely aerated. Now, this is a bit of a naughty chef's trick. A little knob of butter in there, just in top. So when it blends, it gets really nice and smooth. Lid on, onto the blender, and we'll just pulse it on and off first. Wow. And this is the moment we've all been waiting for. Just one side of the bowl. So that's Daddy's portion. That. This little bit is yours. Mmm. Now, a little taste. Blow it gently. Mmm. Yum. 
sound. Christmas is here. Mold wine is a real Christmas classic, but I'm going to give it a modern 21st century twist. First pour red wine into a pan and gently heat. Now I'm going to make a fragrant bouquet garni. Basically a really nice aromatic tea bag. Muslin cloth, absolutely perfect for this. If you haven't got muslin cloth, a brand new J cloth is just as good. Now first off cardamom pods. They are incredibly aromatic and more importantly gives it a really nice dense spicy flavour. Next add a pinch of cloves. Cloves are dried flower buds and add a lovely pungent sweet flavour. Then drop in a couple of star anise which adds an aniseed note. A cinnamon stick. Cinnamon sticks are made from the bark of trees native to Sri Lanka. Break one in and this gives a warm sweet spice to the wine. Lemongrass. So this makes it slightly Asian-y, a little bit more sort of exciting, but gives a really nice light twist to the wine. And all I'm going to do first is just press down on the lemongrass. And what that does, it starts to release all that oil and flavour. Once it's crushed, just cut it over the muslin cloth. Once all your spices are in, fold up the muslin cloth and tie tightly. And look. That is like a little miniature perfect chef's pillow into the wine. Next, add orange zest. Twist, then cut the orange into wedges and pop those in too. To sweeten the wine, put in a tablespoon of demerara sugar. Next, stem ginger. Gives the mulled wine a little bit of a sort of kick. Almost like that really nice sort of ginger beer aftertaste on the back of your throat. Finally, a couple of tablespoons of the ginger syrup, and then simply heat the wine gently for four to five minutes to infuse all the fantastic flavors. But don't let it boil or the alcohol will evaporate. And together with that, the most amazing spice nuts. I love nuts. So I'm using Brazils, almonds, walnuts, and hazelnuts. And then finally, pistachios. Lovely. A really nice festive mix. As the nuts toast, they start to release their natural oils. Then add a couple of pinches of salt, and then just let them lightly toast. Once the nuts start to colour, add half a teaspoon of cayenne pepper, which is made from ground chilies. Then sprinkle in half a teaspoon of paprika, a milder spice made from dried pimentos for sweetness and depth. And now you can see the nuts absorbing all that wonderful flavour. Absolutely delicious. Finally, put in a sprig of rosemary. Give the pan a good toss to make sure all the nuts are thoroughly coated and they're done. My next recipe for panna cotta ticks all the right boxes. It's easy to make and has a silky smooth texture that makes it one of the world's sexiest desserts. First, add 250 milliliters of cream to a pan. Then pour in 50 mils of milk and add 50 grams of caster sugar. Get the sugar in early because it stops the milk and cream from boiling over. Give that a little stir. Bring that up to the ball. Panna cotta, which means cooked cream in Italian, can be flavored with anything from vanilla to coffee to chocolate. I'm giving mine a grown-up kick with a splash of rum. In. Once the cream has come to the boil, take it off the heat and add a couple of leaves of gelatine that have been soaked in cold water and squeezed dry. Then whisk them in. And the gelatine sets the cooked cream. So we want that really nice sort of blancmange texture. Rich, silky, and incredibly smooth. Once the gelatine has dissolved, pour the panna cotta straight into serving glasses. Traditionally, it's set in moulds, then turned out onto a plate, but I'm keeping mine simple. Leave a little space on top for the glaze. Now, set them into the fridge. Beautiful. Next, the pomegranate glaze. Add some caster sugar to the pan and pour in pomegranate juice. Then simply bring it to the boil 
and reduce it down to the consistency of a sticky syrup. In Iran, where pomegranates originated, they use this sweet, sticky syrup to flavor chicken and game birds. A beautiful, rich, sticky glaze. Pour that into a jar. Leave that to cool down. Take the panna cotta from the fridge. They set beautifully. And they're not too firm, just slightly bouncy, a little bit springy on top. Carefully pour the cool pomegranate glaze over. Just roll them around a little bit, just to fill those edges. Finally, take a bar of chocolate that's been chilled in the freezer so it's easier to use and scrape off thin shards. Almost like sort of chocolate gold leaf and sprinkle it on top. First, slice open a vanilla pod and scrape out the seeds. Now the flavor in those seeds is mind blowing. Look at it, beautiful. Now, two whole eggs in. Two, give that a whisk. Next, add 125 grams of unsalted butter to the mixer. Once the butter's soft, add 90 grams of caster sugar and cream them together until they're lovely and smooth. Gradually pour in the beaten eggs and vanilla seeds. Add a pinch of salt and beat thoroughly until the mixture becomes paler. Then put in 250 grams of plain flour and mix until it forms a dough. Should just be nice and firm, slightly soft and not too wet. Perfect. And be careful because you hold it in your hands for too long, it starts to melt. Flour your hands on the board and shape the dough into a circle. And it's got a really nice, soft, sensual, sexy feel. Really nice and creamy. Now roll it out to a thickness of one centimeter. Cut out a large circle, then put it onto a baking tray lined with parchment and decorate. Half again. Just like my grandma used to make. Thumb in and in. Chill the shortbread for an hour to help it set. Then bake it in a medium oven for 20 minutes until it turns a pale golden color. Just sprinkle a little bit of sugar. Really nice to do it when it's just come out so it sort of, it melts into the shortbread. Nice and generous. And that's perfect for a cup of tea mid-afternoon. As well as filling your biscuit tin over Christmas, this shortbread can easily be transformed into a great festive dessert. Using a hot spoon, scoop out lozenges of creme fraiche and sit that on top. Then grate over the zest of a clementine. And finish with clementine halves. The tartness of the creme fraiche works with the sweetness of the clementine. 